Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dave Roth. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Avisher. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your time. We know that uh, you all are very busy. We want to offer um, as much valuable content as we can, though, to be in constant communication with our, our customer base. So, But we do appreciate your time, and we'll do our best. Um, if you're not familiar with Avisher, um, we have a mission that we help people keep people safe. Um, and we're happy to be known that way in the market as, as Avisher. And today's webinar uh, is third in a customer webinar series. Uh, the first one was just a general update of, uh, from Avisher to, uh, to you, our customers. Uh, the second was specifically focused on our hardware offerings. Uh, we offer an array of solutions to fit various um, functionality and, and price and capability uh, points that are needed. And today it was really focused on uh, our software. And today's title is Solving Virtual Nursing and Patient Safety from One Platform. Um, the next webinar, which is next month, we're doing one per month, will be more focused around um, our clinical program success and the offerings there. Um, and so we'll continue this monthly communication. As we um, go forward with these webinars, we'll also start bringing in um, you, our customers, and panelist discussions and thought leadership topics and so forth. And so my um, one request throughout the webinar via, and this is a little bit of housekeeping for everyone, is via the uh, Q&A section, please ask us questions as we'd like to address them either along the webinar or at the end of the webinar. And we want to make sure that this is a good two-way dialogue. Also, we'll ask one or two survey questions just to ensure we know um, where you sit with the various topics that we're talking about in today's presentation. So we really want to have a, a good two-way dialogue um, as we keep going. So um, next slide, please. So I'll thank Laura Melendez from our marketing team. She's um, running the slides behind the scenes. But uh, in terms of our two presenters, which you should see, I'm not sure if we've ever had two more charming presenters on these webinars. And I want to thank both uh, Stacy and Elizabeth uh, for joining us uh, for today's topic. Stacy Over Overholt, who's MBA, BSN, RN, is our Director of Clinical Program Success. And Elizabeth Votruba, MSN RN, is our Chief Clinical Innovation Officer. And so we're delighted to have you both on the call, not only to present, but to answer any questions that, that folks might have. And without further ado, I think, Lizbeth, I turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sure we are charming, but last month was the hardware um, webinar, and I know Chris Plank and some of our engineers and our VP of Innovation, pretty charming too. Um, but it's really, uh, it is fun. I don't know, it's been a while since Stacy and I have presented together and I consider her not just a colleague, but a friend. And we've been on this journey together for at least eight years. Um, so this is, this is fun for us to talk about and talk to the insider group. Um, this is a webinar I think over 90% of y'all are already customers with the Telesitter solution. And so we're very excited to talk about um, what else you can do right now with what you already have. And um, the pressures to leverage technology to enhance your bedside caregivers just continues. Um, so we wanted to be sure that you're all aware of um, how, you can, how you can leverage uh, for sure um, for even more expanded use cases. We had some great questions come in already that we'll address during the webinar. So we kind of, um, I think there are two distinct sections that we'll be covering today. We'll start out talking about the Avisher Telesitter solution and um, what's new on it and, and how it's addressing some of the just increasing patient safety challenges over the last few years. Touch on a, a case study and, and then Stacy's gonna kind of talk about the new features uh, within the Telesitter solution. And then uh, we'll also take some time to talk about telenurse and for patient um, quality and staff satisfaction and why the need is increasing. We have commissioned some market research on that. So I have little insider tidbits about the market and um, it, is, it is a hot topic. And, um, and 
and how what tools that we have really specifically around our software applications uh, verify and connect. So before we go to the next slide, though, um, we're going to launch our first poll, which is just kind of about your current challenges that are keeping you up at night. Um, so give that, um, I'll give that a minute. So um, workforce shortage, the experience complexity gap is losing experienced um, nurses, uh, maybe baby, baby boomers retiring, while the patient complexity increases. Patient acuity is increasing as well as uh, complex behavioral health patients. Um, the patient impact of the pandemic being quality, you know, we're not winning the quality battle. Uh, we've lost ground on that. And then uh, the crunch of finances. Um, so let's see how that poll is shaping up. We'll be uh, at time in about 10 more seconds, Lizbeth. Okay. All of the above, exclam exclamation point. <laughs> okay. So all of the above uh, gets the most votes. Um, oh, it looks like you're allowed to choose more than one because I, I can do math. I'm an old ICU nurse that, that started ICU you before electronic health records so I can do math in my head um, and I have I have heard people say the top three problems are workforce workforce and workforce um, but that of course impacts uh, the rest so um, very interesting um, so moving on um, to the next slide uh, earlier this month I had the privilege to do a webinar with one of my oh I skipped ahead a slide. <laughs> Let's talk about some of those challenges, drill down a little deeper on those challenges that are really related to patient safety. And, and you can just wonder who it is that I did the webinar with until we get to that slide. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I, I think we all know that falls are extremely expensive. It's the most common adverse event that happens in the hospital. And then there's litigation and there's non reimbursed so increased length of stay. Um, as well as the psychological and emotional toll on, on patients when they fall. Um, while we are continually year over year losing psychiatric beds, uh, the behavioral health challenges are increasing. You, you know, if it wasn't for the pandemic, the opioid epidemic would have been a top story. Deaths from opioid uh, increased 33% in 2020. And, and that almost wasn't even covered, but we are feeling that in emergency departments and in healthcare. Um, OSHA is the one that first reported that healthcare workers are four times more likely to suffer from violence. Um, staff turnover is high, and this statistic that nursing assistant turnover rate is 28% a year is a pre-pandemic statistic. Um, and I can't imagine that that has improved. Um, there's multiple uh, studies and systematic reviews showing that sitters actually don't you don't work. The more sitters you have, the more falls you have if you're relying on one to one. And um, and, and sitters, one to one sitters actually are some of the most at risk for violence. Eighty percent of them reporting experiencing violent events from patients. So this is kind of the setting for why um, you all probably turned to Avisure to implement telesitting for um, patient safety. And uh, before I move to the next slide, one of the questions was about um, what uses are we seeing for um, virtual monitoring or telesitting that's beyond just fall prevention. So I will say um, keeping staff safe and um, monitoring for workplace violence events in acute care is a big one, as well as um, um, self-harm, low to moderate risk suicidal patients. Um, University of Wisconsin did a great study about um, eating disorder patients where they were used, having to use one-to-one -one sitters. Um, and then just in, in within COVID too, helping patients keep their medical devices in place, um, not removing their BiPAP or pulling out a PICC line, um, as well as elopement. So many 
reasons that um, monitoring in the patient room um, it keeps patients safe way beyond falls. So that was a great question, and I, I hope I addressed that. Um, now I will talk about the webinar that we were able to record um, earlier this month with one of my nursing heroes, which is Gay Landstrom, and she is the um, senior vice president and chief nursing officer for Trini Health, and she is responsible for the professional practice of 30,000 nurses. And um, so the story that, that they told is um, how they scaled from um, using telesitting and Avisure telesitter solution in pockets of their health system. Individual hospitals had varying degrees of implementation and success. Um, and they had a plan um, to scale that um, system-wide. And uh, it was going to take a couple years, and it was a really thought-out playbook, and Stacy was part of that. Um, but then, in early 2020, when the um, with when the pandemic hit, um, and she talks about this on the webinar, Mike Slabowski, her boss and the CEO of Trinity Health, said there are a lot of priorities that need to be pushed back because of the pandemic, but uh, implementing Avisure Telesitter needs to be pushed up on a scaled way. So we shortened our implementation by um, from years down to, I think, six to nine months. And um, you can see that they have two hubs, one in Chicago and one in Connecticut. And from those hubs, they monitor patients in all of their um, all of their ministries across the country. So those from those little lines, you can see they're monitoring patients safely with no latency from Connecticut to California. And, um, and not only that, in uh, 2021, they provided 1.8 million hours of um, telesitting. And uh, the cost of that versus the at $2.20 an hour versus the cost of what that would be for them to be paying one-to-one -one sitters um, and certainly not minimum wage and often a nurse who is putting in some overtime um, or agency um, is, is how they uh, were able to achieve that $23 million labor savings, which um, is what she talked about um, along with me in this webinar. So there's a link in the chat if you want to um, review that as well. Um, but scaling from uh, in decentralized uh, hospital-based program to a more centralized regional or state is um, kind of a common adoption model for our customers. So here comes our second poll. We'd love to see where you're at on, on that journey. Um, and so if you can launch that poll and then Stacy can kind of talk about um, um, how, what we've learned in doing that multiple times. So are you planning to centralize? Yes, you're not sure. No, you're not going to centralize. You're going to keep it at the individual level. Or is your program already centralized? And um, I saw on the attendee list, there are several um, of you that are already within a system that's very centralized. Mm -hmm. um, so love to see um, where we're at as a group on this journey, on this part of the adoption model. Uh, let's give it 10 more seconds. Oh, a lot already are centralized. Most are already centralized in some manner and others are planning. I didn't get to see that for too long. Yeah, that went pretty quick. Oh, uh, thank you. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Play, All so right. Yeah, great. Yeah, so, so it looks like there are definitely um, some attendees that are are thinking about or not quite sure whether centralizing is the the right option. Um, and those of you who are already centralized, uh, you'll probably be able to relate to the next part of this conversation. But if you're considering moving 
from localized programming, meaning having a monitoring hub local within one site and monitoring patients only from that site. Um, if you're considering moving from that to centralized operations where you may have monitoring staff centrally located in a hospital or an outbuilding or a facility where they can provide monitoring for patients in multiple hospitals within your system, you're definitely following industry trends. Um, so we've helped over, I don't even know what the number is anymore, but over 100 hospital systems convert their localized telesitting models to centralized enterprise programs, like Lizbeth was saying about, about Trinity Health as, as one example. And it, it, it's really increased in volume that we're doing this over the last couple of years. And our response to that is we knew this was coming and, and this was needed. And over the last two and a half to three years, we've really been focusing on developing a robust platform that is going to be, you know, that, that, is, that is able to support this move, but also transitioning to um, creative acquisition models. And these acquisition models can enable hospital systems to access a move like this or refresh their devices or expand their programs um, and using some operational funds, using some capital funds, it just kind of depends on what way you want to go. Um, so if you're thinking about this, you know, just know that that there are, are ways um, that, that this is reachable for any size hospital, any number of hospitals, any size hospital system. And centralizing really has so many benefits. Um, the, the biggest benefits, of course, are, are the obvious ones. I think staffing efficiency, having a monitor staff member that may have previously only been at a, a hospital monitoring only six devices because that's all the hospital needed, but they could max out at 12. Um, creating those efficiencies, uh, consistent policies and processes, um, understanding from a strategic enterprise level what the goal of telesitting is and developing those policies around that so everybody is really following the same reason for use and the same needs um, and, and, and having that consistency to meet outcomes. And then it, obviously the, the consistent training and performance of the monitor staff. The monitor staff make the telesitting program. They're a super important, important um, piece of that. Uh, they need to develop trust with the bedside staff. And so um, having a centralized model can, can really narrow that training down, can focus on performance, can have a lot of different um, um, impact on the, the, the skill and ability of the monitor staff that you choose to, um, to hire. So the Avisure platform, as I mentioned earlier, it's built to support this model through technical features such as uh, scalable server clusters, seamless failover um, to prevent downtimes, and multiple interchangeable applications. And these applications support use cases that are even over and above in addition to telesitting, which is, is what we're really going to try to, to focus on. Um, when Trinity moved to their centralized oper operations model, it obviously took collaboration and planning and a lot of teamwork. But with our commitment and, and our ability to provide that with the different resources that we have in our company and guiding Trinity through setting up the resources that they needed to get that done in their organization, we were able to swiftly set up their operate operations at both of their hubs. And we were able to even ramp up their rollout um, um, much, much, much faster than um, was originally planned. So there are a couple of important keys to creating a successful hub and spoke program. And again, um, these keys are, are things that our, our team will help with. But first, it's important to choose a hub location that can accommodate the space for one monitor station for every 12 to 16 devices planned. Uh, one of the questions that came in was a question about the monitor staff um, to patient ratio. And industry-wide, when we look at all of our customers and um, speak to them and look at their metrics, most of our customers are monitoring at a one to 12 ratio. Um, the, the software and the, um, the screen, the, the client software will hold up to 16 room views. And so that's the maximum number of patients one person can monitor when sitting in front of the screen. But that 16, I think is, um, 
is, and you can see a, a picture of that here, that 16 is, it's sometimes reserved for um, flexibility. What if there's break coverage that needs to occur or if there's a monitor uh, staff member that's monitoring higher acuity patients and another staff member needs to take on more patients on their monitor station to support that. Um, so that flexibility is built in, but typically the average ratio is a one monitor staff member to 12 patients um, in, a, in a hub and spoke scenario. Um, when you're looking at your location also for the hub, you'll wanna plan for a manager area and a training area. Um, so we've seen hubs with two or three monitor stations. We've seen hubs with 15 to 20 monitor stations. Um, it just kind of depends on the size and, and how, how big you wanna go, but, but it's, it's supported. Um, we are testing in excess of, I, maybe correct me if I'm wrong team, but in excess of 500 devices and, um, and able to support all of that on one server cluster. Um, the important piece here though really is the space, readily available technical resources, and you really do need to plan for 24 seven oversight on the premise for the on-premise for that, for that staff. Um, next, and I, I alluded to this a little bit, but it's important to begin the process of standardizing telesitter policy. Um, you, you can go back um, one slide. Um, these should directly align with system leadership expectations. And that's a whole ball, a whole can of worms to open up, um, but it's really important uh, to make sure that there is a global understanding of why you're bringing this technology in and what you're expected to do with this technology and what the, um, the leadership and stakeholders are wanting to see from the use of this technology. Setting up a steering committee is another key for this work and the operational oversight of the program. Um, it, it is a must. And then involving a clinical champion or two from each participating hospital is important as well. It's imperative that there is a, a plan in place at each site. And, and this plan needs to um, make sure that each site is upholding the policy that's been created and upholding the expected use of the program. So I know this sounds like a big undertaking. Um, it, it is some work, but this system, when attention is is applied to um, creating a workflow and creating the work around it and the standardized workflows and policies and processes, um, it, it's going to work and it's going to be successful for you. We've done this many times. We'll provide tools and guidance to get you there. So I'm gonna um, switch of, of gears just a little bit. I still am gonna focus a little bit on expanding tel um, telesitting to centralized um, uh, care model. But I want to show you some of the things that we've developed recently that are going to impact um, communication with the patient and staff and are going to make that centralizing just that much nicer. Um, so uh, go ahead to the next slide, please. So we have a couple of new um, devices. They've been rolled out. You've probably seen these before, but are the first picture on the left um, there kind of um, next to the patient bed shows our guardian mobile device with our video screen. So we call it our two-way guardian mobile device. And then the picture on the right shows our new access wall mount device. Um, and the access wall mount device will um, hang next to a TV that's already in a patient room and will plug in um, right into the HDMI port and will use the TV for the video uh, communication. So both of these hardware models allow for the two-way video communication between uh, patient and staff. And the nice thing about this is through our software, the video can be enabled or disabled by device. So it's really patient-centered. You may have one patient on your screen that won't tolerate the video portion or doesn't want it on, and you may have other patients that do. So you can certainly set this by patient. If the video is not right for the patient, it can certainly be turned off. In telesitting, um, if the, the video is, um, if it's enabled, it's activated when the monitor staff presses that green microphone button in the upper right-hand corner of the room view. So when that microphone is pressed, the video will automatically come on on the device and it will remain on during the conversation and it'll turn off once the conversation is over. The access device, like I said before, connects directly into the TV in the patient's room. And so if a patient is watching the program and the monitor staff is trying to communicate with them, 
their program will momentarily be replaced by the video of the monitor staff during communication. And um, when the communication is over, it will automatically return uh, to the program and process. Um, next slide. In addition to the two-way video option, the staff can now also communicate to the, um, mon the, the bedside staff can communicate to the monitor staff by pressing the lower right corner of the video screen on the, on the device. I know you all are, are excited about this. We've been asked year over year over year, how can we um, make it easier for the staff at the bedside to communicate with the, with the monitoring staff? So once that little, and it's really hard to see in this picture, but once that little area in the lower right-hand corner of the screen on the device is pressed, it will generate a flashing um, border around the appropriate room view, and the monitor staff will be able to answer and communicate with staff through the device. Um, so this is used, it's really nice to use it to request privacy. It's also great, great for handoff report from the bedside if you're, if you're doing that. Um, and it's great for just communicating with the monitor staff rather than having to pick up a phone and look up the number and dial the number and, um, and get to them that way. So we have hopefully helped you realize that the Avisure Telesitter program that you already have is one of the first steps toward an enterprise solution for patient safety. Um, the, our team, of course, will guide you through um, building an, an infrastructure to support centralization of this program. Um, and I think that the added communication and, and video features to the application will enhance that patient and staff experience even more. But it's, it's really just the beginning of what can reside on this platform. The flexibility of the Avisher platform provides the ability not only to grow and expand telesitting, but also um, at really at any time during your journey, whether you're going from localized to enterprise or you're at localized and you want to put a step in between that, you can implement other virtual care models using the same hardware and the same software that, that we're, um, we're talking about today. So we're going to shift gears now and we're going to talk a little bit more about virtual nursing and how you can leverage the Avisure platform for this particular use case and, and you're not going to need any different equipment or any additional licensing cost. Um, before we jump into that, we're going to launch another poll. Um, and this poll is going to specifically be about um, virtual nursing. So what is your level of interest in virtual nursing for your hospital? Um, very interested. Are you, have you formed committees? Are you investigating this right now? Slightly interested. Is this kind of an idea that's been tossed around, but nobody's really grasping it yet? Eh, not sure if you want to take on that work or no, um, we've decided that this is something that's not going to enter through our doors. All right, we're coming up on 10 more seconds before we close the poll. Um, to Stacy and Elizabeth, in the meantime, I do want to let you know that one question did come in, which was worded, when considering a location for a hub in the hub and spoke model, um, how do you evaluate the labor pool in the area or the location mm -hmm. of that I'm taking, uh, you know, in the location of that hub? So I, I don't know if, if it's meant to be allocating the hub or et cetera. Um, but can um, when we're done with the poll here, if you could talk a little bit about how choose how we choose a hub and a hub location and how that gets set up. Sure. Interesting. So, yeah. Close to seventy percent. Very interested. And if you add that, we're at eighty three percent on the slightly or very interested. Great. Stacy, do you want to um, talk about? Um, the hub location before we shift into um, virtual nursing, because that's a great question. Sure. Yeah, and, and um, you know, it's probably going to be a bit different um, based on, on locale, uh, region, um, the size of the community that you're going to be moving a hub to. I know we have one hospital system who looked and looked and looked and found that the best area for their hub was in a smaller town in a smaller community hospital where they happen to have space and they are 
um, rock stars with with monitoring. Um, you know, there are um, systems who have decided to centralize their hub at corporate headquarters that are usually in big cities. And so when you're evaluating the labor pool, it may be a little bit easier to do it that way. Um, but essentially what you're going to be looking for is um, staff that have some kind of hospital experience. They're familiar with patient care. Um, they're familiar with some of the processes that happen as patients are being cared for um, in a hospital. Uh, typically we see um, uh, CNAs or PCTs that are um, moved into this role. And with a hub, the nice thing about this is the staff will be localized at the hub. And so this will be the, they're really their only role. And what we've found is that through, um, through good management and um, active departmental engagement, such as um, you know, staff meetings and awards or comp like friendly competitions or promoting people to level twos, things like that, that this becomes a job role that the team is proud of and, um, and they're, they're dedicated to doing this and they make the work that much better. Um, so that's just a little snippet, but of course we have a full team that um, will help you evaluate that, um, your HR, um, in your hospital will be able to help with that too. And you'll want to consider things such as union versus non-union and things like that. So um, lots of experience there, but um, hopefully that was a, a quick answer for that. Yeah, and um, I also student nurses is a great- um, yes. 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 A, yes, 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 for sure. <laughs> so if you've got a nursing school nearby, that can be a good um, adjunct to that pool. And also maybe even a pipeline into your hospital when you want to recruit them when they're um, graduating. And I think there's somebody from Oxner who registered for the webinar and we did a webinar with them last year. And th this is intentional career pathing for them and um, bringing in, um, it's, it's almost an entry level um, healthcare position and just is a wonderful place to start and get into healthcare for um, um, the community. So um, great. And so I wasn't and going to the next slide, just kind of looking at the market drivers that we're seeing about um, why virtual nursing is, why 83% of you are interested or very interested in virtual nursing. Um, that's kind of different now in 2022. Um, and uh, so the RN turnover rate, uh, the new grad turnover rate was 24% prior to the pandemic. Um, NSI uh, National Healthcare Retention and RN Staffing Report in 2021 said that an 1% increase in turnover for a regular 300 bed hospital costs $270,000 a year. So that the turnover rate is, is not getting better than 24% and that's expensive. And then um, vacancy rates lead to having to shut down beds if, if you really cannot staff. And um, Stacy and I were at a hospital um, just a couple weeks ago that had a specialty unit where they had to shut down several beds uh, and were losing revenue just because of their a very high vacancy rate. Um, and then the American Nurses Foundation has been doing some pulse surveys. Um, and in 2021 to 2022, those nurses considering leaving their position grew um, and um, so that's kind of a very scary statistic and there are um, I, I did put the references down here if you want to look further at that pulse survey um, and that that is thinking about leaving their current position not necessarily thinking about leaving the profession um, but there there's that and then the aging um, baby boomers maybe not wanting to abandon their colleagues in the middle of the height of the pandemic, now feeling like now is the time to um, check out or retire. And so you're not only losing numbers, you're losing expertise and experience. And at the same time, the novice nurses graduating didn't get the same clinical experience during school that Stacy and I did. <laughs> 
back in the 90s uh, <laughs> where, <laughs> um, and, and and some of that was done in the sim lab um, on top of that and this is starting to create a perfect storm now um, the complexity of patients and acuity patients continues to rise and uh, on top of that is behavioral behavioral health issues so it's kind of creating this perfect storm which is i think what's driving the interest and not only the interest but um, the necessity of looking at technology to enhance your bedside caregivers technology to make sure your nurses are at the top of their license um, and and then we're not um, winning the uh, quality battle anymore and so we made incremental progress on decreasing hospital acquired infections on sepsis mortality and and then all of a sudden we've just lost a lot of momentum in those areas so on the patient quality side as well um, so we um, commissioned the um, jocelyn insight market research firm to do some research on um, virtual nursing. And that happened to be the same firm that did the American Nurse Foundation COVID pulse surveys. They also do surveys, uh, they have supported AONL and the DAISY Foundation. So they're kind of nurses uh, market researchers. So they did um, late last year, a qualitative interview with uh, 15 nurse leaders that led to a survey um, that they, they provided and we got 262 respondents to that survey about virtual nursing. And the response rate in itself tells you something that there's a lot of interest. And um, from there, we developed uh, in these two models of a place to start. Where do I start with virtual nursing right now? And um, then I'm gonna talk about later where it should be in five years because somebody asked that really good question. Um, but what about right now? Um, and, and so there's two main models that we are seeing emerging that have a good value proposition as in a great place to start. Um, and so the first one in, in the first column there is a clinical resource nurse. And that virtual remote nurse is focused on admission and discharge activities, offloading some of the documentation burden from the bedside caregivers, patient education, as well as nurse mentoring. And, um, and, and somebody had posed a question, how can virtual nursing support new grads? So this is a great way. Um, I think new grads feel isolated. Um, literally, they're in the isolation room and, and their preceptor is in another isolation room. So the idea that there's this resource, um, especially in the night shift, um, uh, the night shift ratio of new grad nurses is pretty high in a lot of areas and um, there are less resources on the night shift. I used to kind of like the night shift because you, <laughs> you, you had a degree of autonomy and independence, which is great when you have a lot of experience. Um, so, and, and it's more focused on that med surge area, that busy med surge environment. And that was another question, how can we help the busy med surge environment? So, what did we hear that chief nurse called it, Stacy? That that's a pancake unit, meaning it flips. <laughs> I never heard that term. It's a pancake unit before, but the patients flip. The ADT, the admission discharge, is very high, and that doesn't show really maybe on your um, hours per patient day, but that sure is a burden on the bedside care nurses doing the admission process and the discharge process, and so that's more episodic. Um, the virtual nurse is in with the patient for a period of time, one-to-one, -one, often focus on med surge, ED holding areas, or a step-down intermediate, and they can really improve um, patient flow. They can kind of help uh, uh, open up bottlenecks. They decrease the admission dismissal process by 30 minutes. Um, and then there's some uh, patient experience scores that are really targeted around nurse communication. And Stacy's going to talk about why a virtual nurse on our platform actually enhances patient experience and was designed for patient experience. Um, and then that bedside RN retention, um, if, if they got that support and they can focus on um, maybe less documentation and more on, on the patient engagement activities and at the top of their license. And then the next column is that expert 
oversight nurse um, supporting. So this is maybe a CCRN or an experienced ICU nurse supporting a cohort, a group of high acuity or maybe even isolation patients across their whole shift. They're reviewing and responding to clinical triggers, algorithms that are great algorithms in the EHR or your physiologic monitoring, um, or a, a, even a bedside nurse can, can trigger the expert oversight nurse to review a case. Um, and, and they can proactively round on those high acuity patients. Uh, is, are the vet settings what they're supposed to be? Are we on top of our CLABSI prevention bundle? Um, more focused in ICU intermediate, maybe um, med surge emergency department, and that's a continuous model, and they're responding. Um, and and one of the ways they're really helpful is preventing leakage. Um, so maybe helping uh, a high acuity patients stay in a rural hospital um, that has just a few beds, and they're supporting the expertise of the nurse and the staff there. So that patient doesn't have to be transferred, which is, is great um, for the patient experience and their families, as well as um, the healthcare system, just keeping the patients at the, the most optimal areas. Um, preventing those hospital acquired adverse events. CLABSI costs $48,000. Um, and a, a, a Michigan hospital recently published that in in 2020, they had 12 CLABSIs. In 2021, they had 60 CLABSIs. And the CDC um, is the one that says it's $48,000. So that's $3.4 million if you jump up to 60 CLABSIs in a year. Um, so just working on those um, in clinical quality improvement as well as preventing failure to rescue are just important ways that these two top models provide value and um, and, and benefit to your staff and patients. And going to the next slide, um, Stacy's going to just talk about exactly how the Connect and Verify platform work. Yeah, so um, we're going to get in now into a little bit of discussion on the actual features that have been very um, have been considered um, based on clinical feedback and are of value to the user. Um, you know, we work really hard to not just put features in applications to make them cool or look great. Um, you know, of course we want it to look great, but the more important focus is adding features that are usable and that help nurses with their day-to-day their -day work, whatever care model, help monitor techs, whatever care model they're, they're, they're trying to use with this technology. So we're really um, talking about a patient-focused design here and a clinical-focused design. And our Connect application, as Lizbeth mentioned earlier, is used really more for the um, episodic and, um, and, and um, mobile or as-needed use. And that um, clinical resource nurse can be located in the central location and that clinical resource nurse can have either a schedule or some communication from a support person at the bedside or, or at um, on the units or, or in the hospital or however they want to design it. And, um, and, and that, that, that support nurse can work in a couple of different um, areas, but some of the features that support things like that are um, a built-in patient queue so that that virtual nurse can just pull up a list and know who, what patient is next on the list to um, go through an admission process or go through discharge education with. Um, also, there are integration um, capabilities with this platform and the ability, that, um, as you can see here from the picture, you're connected only to one patient at a time. So this is not a monitoring scenario. You're not watching a cohort of patients. You're not um, rounding or checking in on patients frequently with this application. You're, you're either bringing a device to the room when needed or accessing a device that's already in the room when needed. And you're episodically meeting with that patient and then probably going on to another patient or another patient. And so, um, you know, because of this, the, the integration with right now that we have with Epic, enables the user or the clinician to log into or, or um, access the specific patient 
that is in um, need for the service. So whether it be an admission, a discharge, or, or supporting a nurse or, or things like that, and they can access right from the Epic platform, they can um, access the camera. And so they can, they can go to a section in Epic, um, they can select um, open view of patient. And if that patient, you know, that patient will have a camera in their room, that view will pop up in the form that you see it here on the picture, and they will be able to communicate, visualize, and simultaneously work in Epic um, for, the, for, for that visit. Couple of other things to mention about this application um, is, you know, that first bullet point there is so important these days. Everybody's still wearing a mask in the hospitals, which is needed. So this may be the only time a patient sees a caregiver without a mask on. And the mm -hmm. ability to have that face-to-face -face communication, especially with um, geriatric patients who are um, maybe having a hard time hearing or things like that is is a real bonus to doing some of the more intimate question and answer se sessions um, over over the the um, technology. A um, couple of other things too, the um, audio is hands free. So when you open up this application, you're automatically having a two way audio path open so that you can carry on a conversation with the patient family or staff that's in the room, just like we're carrying, or I'm carrying on a conversation right now and I can talk back and forth with Lizbeth openly and I'm not having to press any microphone buttons or anything like that. The other benefit with this application is the automatic two-way video. The video automatically comes on, there's no turning it on or turning it off um, in between uh, pauses or conversations, it will remain on. Uh, the only um, thing is, is the caregiver or the user of the application can actually disable the video so they're not showing to the patient, but they'll always be able to see the patient. And that's just a choice or if they have to turn their heads to do something else, um, they may want to turn the video off to avoid confusion. But, um, but the, the automatic um, audio and the automatic video, leaving the hands free to type in the EMR to look through uh, reports or, or things like that is, is key. Um, the pan, tilt, zoom, and stat alarm is available. So those of you that are Telesitter users, you know that the pan, tilt, zoom is really important and even more so when a uh, clinical resource nurse is assisting a bedside nurse um, with an admission process. Um, maybe they're zooming in and out. Maybe they're um, needing to look at the patient's name bracelet. Maybe they're helping the bedside nurse look at a wound. It just um, is so important to have that high quality Zoom. Um, if we were doing a live demo, we'd be able to show you how, how great that is. But since you're Telesitter users, you know, you, it's, it's, it's very much the same as that. Um, and this uh, application allows for, um, for screenshots. And so if you need to uh, dump a screenshot of something into the EMR, um, you, you would be able to do that. The stat alarm is available for during the communication. If there is a situation where the virtual nurse needs to summon uh, help into the room, they can certainly activate the stat alarm. Um, docking of the patient view window. Um, this is, is really um, important too. So if you're not using Epic context aware linking integration uh, that I talked about a little bit earlier, you can still access the, the device and the camera through the um, connect application, and you can dock the image or the view of the patient and move it around anywhere you need to on your screen. And simultaneously, I think we have an image of that, I thought mm -hmm. on the next slide, um, mm -hmm. sim simultaneously um, can be working in the EMR. So even though it's not integrated with the EMR, it's, um, go ahead to the next slide, it's, um, it's overlaid, uh, maybe one more. There we go. Um, you can see here it's overlaid um, on the view right um, below the camera and the nurse um, can simply work in the EMR while that's occurring. Picture this though. I mean, this is my favorite feature. This is so important. The, if you don't have this feature and if you have to use two screens and have the patient view on another screen and you have the camera on another screen, this is what it's gonna look like if the user or the clinician has to continue to look and ask interview questions and type in responses. 
in the EMR. Okay, you said you've been married for how long? Okay, got that. Um, okay, now let's talk a little bit about your medical history. Tell me about your paternal grandmother. Okay, got that, okay. And you get that <laughs> looking away and looking back, looking away and looking back. This docking feature really creates that seamless gaze angle that allows the patient to always be engaged. So I think those are some of the main features we wanted to cover with Connect. I did wanna also mention that in our Connect application, um, there is a visit log. And so after use um, at any time, you can go back and pull an event log that will show you the duration of the visit, any notes from the visit, the reason for the visit, and be able to use that for, um, for documenting, for time checks, um, or even for following up with patients if you're doing discharge. Um, go back to the previous slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the clinical oversight model. This is the application that we recommend using for the clinical oversight model. This is called Avisher Verify. Um, as Lizbeth mentioned, this is a way to manage a cohort of patients. Um, with the Connect model, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner of this image, there is up to 38 views that you can populate with a thumbnail size view of the patient room. So our telesitter is up to 16. Connect application is just one-on-one. -on -one. The Verify application is um, up to 38 room views. It is really easy to add and remove these views. It takes about two clicks. And in order to communicate with one patient at a time, you simply click on the thumbnail and it opens up into the center of the application, allowing for uh, communication and um, pan tilt zoom and all of the features that you would expect the, the um, device to have. When you do open up the, um, open up the thumbnail into a larger view, the nice thing is, is that this has a little bit of a different approach to audio. This application has what we call toggle to talk, which means you toggle the microphone button by pressing it, but the audio and the pathway for both patient and on the monitoring or the staff remains open. And so once you turn the audio on, you can carry on a conversation, you don't have to worry about hitting that microphone every time you want to talk and releasing it every time you want to listen. And when your conversation is over, you can hit that microphone button again and your conversation will be muted and um, you won't have the, the open audio anymore. Um, that toggle to talk feature was a direct request from some of the users of this application and it really um, helped simplify them um, um, using other applications such as EMR, such as physiologic monitors alongside of the Verify application. You wouldn't wanna use this in a monitoring scenario where a patient needed continuous monitoring um, because the thumbnails are, are quite small. You can see movement, they are live view thumbnails, um, but you're only ex um, able to access that one, one center view and communicate with one patient at a time. But think about this for um, a cohort of, of higher acuity patients that, that you need to round on. Or let's say throughout the hospital, um, you're being triggered when there's um, some kind of sepsis and deterioration and you're trying to improve your CLABSI and CAUTI scores and you're, you're, um, you're, you're wanting to monitor a patient a little bit closer, maybe every 15 minutes. And so you can have a um, expert oversight nurse just clicking through the cohort of patients that's on the screen um, and checking in as needed, looking at monitors, following along in the EMR, looking at lab results, and really just providing that extra support to the, to the nursing staff. Um, some hospitals are using this for a continuous line of sight. So um, potentially there are many um, uh, isolation rooms on the unit and they want to pull this application up on a computer on the unit uh, so they can communicate and just quickly access a patient when needed without having to um, go into the room. Um, this is another application that if you have a lot of cameras and you have a night shift on a unit and there's a lot of new nurses, this would be a great way to use it as well um, for, for that resource, either one of those two applications. Um, so the moral of the story here is um, we have applications 
that are working and available today for you to start your virtual nursing um, programs. We have clinical resources for you to use um, from our from Avisher to help you get these um, programs started. And these two models that that Lizbeth and I have been talking about are essentially the um, based on the the market research, the low hanging fruit, and and really the 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 models that are easiest to build a workflow around with somewhat minimal resources. Um, again, uh, with our subscription acquisition model, you have access to these applications at no additional cost and unlimited number of licensing. So um, you would be able to turn these on um, at, at any time with a, a little bit of work and help from us. Um, Lizbeth, any additional comments? Um, somebody asked the question, where do you see virtual nursing in five years? And so I think this is where we see virtual nursing right now. Um, but in five years from now, I see it as uh, an integrated part of the care team. And that, and it's promoting working at the top of the license. So it's it's a, a, a an interdisciplinary team that is focused on bedside um, care and that expert is there for many other reasons for every patient. Um, and that may include a chemotherapy certified nurse who's there to double check chemo administration or you know, some of those high risk double check um, incidents that happen. And overseeing and, and um, making sure that there's an LPN functioning at the top of their li uh, license at the bedside, and then um, a registered nurse or even advanced practice nurse um, at the other end providing. And, and that also improves patients' access to the highest level of care and um, professionals working at the top of their license. Um, we already have uh, one customer who's using this for a woundostomy nurse. So they had a smaller satellite hospital. Those patients didn't have access to that certified wound ostomy nurse, but now they do. Um, so thank you for whoever wrote that question. And um, that's where I see it. And where we are right now, you can build on the um, value and ROI that you're getting from sitter reduction and fall reductions and help that self-fund the beginning of your virtual care uh, nursing and um, just continue to provide value for your healthcare system, your patients, and your nurses. Hey, Elizabeth, I think we should uh, just do a quick time check here. We have two more minutes yep. for those who did, kind of dedicated the hour. Laura, could you walk us to the next slide? So did want to mention everybody on the line that we are having another webinar next month in September, which will focus exclusively on the clinical program success. So if you're a customer that's looking to, you know, further um, map out your business case, make improvements, engage with Stacy and her team, uh, we're going to talk about the benefits of doing that um, next month. And also we have our symposium where we bring all of our customers together virtually in October 26th through 27th. So um, I did want to acknowledge that there are some questions here. I'm going to just use first names, Amy, Jay, uh, and Jeffrey, we can follow back with you. For those folks who do have questions, send us an email to info at avisher.com. That's one of those great email addresses that hits all of us in marketing and lots more folks. We are gonna be sure to get back to you. Um, for those of you who know the name of your clinical specialist, use them as well, You know, reach out. Um, these are the kind of discussions we want to keep, um, keep going. So. Uh, unfortunately, we do have a number of questions here that we're not going to be able to get to today. Elizabeth, I'm going to just check in with you if there, I know there are one or two that were submitted ahead of time. If you want to have any closing comments, let's just give it a quick 60 seconds and then we'll wrap. Uh, um, yeah, it is two o'clock now, but um, someone asked a great question. Why Avisher for virtual nursing? And I just think that it we are absolutely the right place at the right time to help support this need. So we have a deep clinical bench of a lot of nurses, 12% uh, of our company are nurses, and you have the versatility of using it for patient safety or virtual nursing with the same devices, the same platform. And um, 
in nearly a thousand hospitals. And I think, but most importantly, that we're going to keep growing and innovating with you all like we have been. That's perfect. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you um, both Stacy and Lizbeth. Really appreciate um, okay. uh, all the information. Again, folks, please answer the survey as you exit the webinar. Give us some feedback in terms of how we're doing in future topics would be extremely helpful to all of us. And with that, um, Laura, if you could take us to the close of the webinar. Thanks everybody, have a great day.